All right. Um, so today we'll talk about um, gradient boosting and calibration. So uh, before we get started, so I hope all of you handed in the homework because it was due 10 minutes ago. And uh, I'll post the, um, the new homework uh, later today. Possibly tomorrow, but probably later today. And you'll actually have plenty of time for this uh, third homework. The third homework will basically involve doing a supervised learning task and um, having you kind of go full out and try all kind of different models, all kind of different pre-processing methods, and go through the whole model selection procedure as you would do like um, in, in any application. Whereas homework two was sort of uh, restricted to just linear models. Uh, the question, uh, we'll post a solution for homework two, yes. We never posted a solution for homework one, did we? No. We will also post a solution for homework one, even though probably now you're not interested anymore. Okay, so I already sort of hinted at gradient boosting last time. It's another um, method that's usually used uh, together with decision trees, and it's one of the most widely used methods uh, for machine learning in general. Um, it powered a lot of um, decision making on the internet for a long time, like the Facebook timeline and uh, Bing ads and like um, credit card ratings, they were all used um, gradient boosting at some point. A bunch of these might now use neural networks, but uh, still uh, gradient boosting is used a lot. And it's also very commonly the winner of uh, competitions. So before I talk about uh, gradient boosting specific, I want to talk about the m very briefly the more general idea of boosting. So the idea in boosting is that you have learners that are called uh, weak learners. So these are simple models. So this could be a shallow decision tree or um, <clears throat> Traditionally, this was often a decision stump. A decision stump is just a tree of depth one. Um, and um, you use multiple of these very simple learners, of these weak learners, to um, create a more powerful learner. But uh, last time we talked about ensembles. This is also an ensemble technique, but it's sort of smarter than doing bagging. In bagging, you build them all independently and then average them and hope uh, reduces the variance. In boosting, each of the models is very weak, so just averaging them is not going to do it. Instead, what we're doing in boosting is um, we built a very simple model, and then we look at the mistakes the model makes, and we built a new model based on the mistakes of the previous model. So we iteratively improve upon our model using weak learners. Um, there's a couple of techniques that use this. Like uh, one of the more famous one was like Ada boost. There was also gentle boost, and uh, lots of different things called boost. They got uh, quite famous for doing um, image recognition. So once all your uh, all cameras and all phones had like a face detector, the face detector was uh, it's called Viola Jones, and that was using a boosting technique, uh, using very simple. Um, basically decision stumps, but using lots of them together to uh, make very fast predictions. So really, um, there's this whole family of boosting algorithms, and there was like a huge literature, but basically in practice, people now mostly use a single one, which is gradient boosting, and so I want to talk more about gradient boosting. So the idea in gradient boosting is that you iteratively fit the function. So that's always in boosting. But uh, the, the way you do this in gradient boosting is basically you're trying to fit the residual. So let's say you have your true target y, and you fit um, a very simple function f1 to y. Because it's a very simple function, it's not going to do a very good job. So 
what you can look at then is the residual y minus f1 of x. This is all the variance in y that's not explained by f1. And so now you can try to fit this residual. And you can take a function uh, f2. And you tr again, you restrict this to be a very simple function, like a tree of depth 1. And um, you try to fit this residual. Then you sub subtract f2 from this residual. So this now will um, be somewhat closer to 0 than, um, than basically y minus uh, f1. So now f1 plus f2 is a better approximation of y. And so now you fit f3 to the residual of both f1 and f2, and you iterate. And if you do this long enough, the right-hand side will get closer and closer to 0. So your functions together will approximate y more and more closely. Yeah, so as I said in practice, these f's often are uh, decision trees. So then what you get out, if you t basically take, let's say, the last line and you put y on one side and the f's on the other side, what you get is that you get y approximated by uh, a sum of functions, each of one is a decision, each one is a decision tree. So in the end, you make predictions that um, are just the sum of the predictions of the trees. This is sort of, maybe first think of this in the regression setting. In the regression setting, this is very clear. Um, we'll talk about the classification setting in a bit. But imagine this is regression, and then you can very easily think about these residuals. There's, um, so this is the main basic idea. There's a uh, uh, sort of small trick in there, which is that uh, there's a learning rate introduced. So basically, you don't always fit a full function, but, or you fit a full function, but then you don't really trust that function fully that you fit it because you know trees overfit. And so you uh, add a learning rate like 0 0.1, and you only go 0 0.1 in the, in the direction of that tree. And um, this is called gradient boosting because you can think of this as doing gradient descent in the function space. So basically, each of these decision trees tries to model the, gr um, the gradient of the target function. So residuals are basically the, sort of the gradients. And uh, you try to um, subtract the gradient at each step. Which, and this gradient is again expressed as this tree. So I'll try to illustrate this um, a little bit more clearly with a visualization. So here, let's say, so this blue dots are the original function. There's the input feature x and the target y that I want to model in this regression problem. And now, let's say the, the weak learner that I'm using is a tree of depth 2, I think, here. And so the orange function is a tree of depth 2 fitted to this data. Then I take this um, prediction or the formula tree. I multiply it by uh, 0 0.1, because that's my learn let's say that's my learning rate. And this gives me this new function, which is uh, basically the same function, but squashed together. This, is, this orange function you can think of as my gradient step now. Now I take this orange function and I subtract it from the original points, the blue points. And I get a new data set, a data set of the residuals, which are these blue points. They look kind of similar to these, but they're basically a little bit more squashed uh, towards zero because I already fitted a, a function, and this function um, explains some of the variance. So now I have this new data set. The data set, the input feature is the same, but now the target is the residual of our first function. And now I fit again um, a decision tree of depth 2. This is the orange function. I multiply the orange function by 0.1 and add it to the functions that I had before. 
So before, my current solution basically was just the single uh, tree. Now it's a linear combination of two trees. So it's 0 0.1 times the first tree times plus 0 0.1 times the second tree. And you can see now this total prediction is um, like sort of more fine-grained and better approximates the function. Now I take um, this current total prediction, so 0 0.1 times f1 plus 0 time, 0.1 times f2, and I subtract it from my data, and I get a new data set of residuals. This keeps looking uh, more and more like a constant, uh, which is what we want. Also, here I actually added this like several more iterations, and if I do this more and more iterations, um, the residuals will be closer and closer to zero, and the total pr prediction, so the aggregate of 0 0.1 times all the trees, uh, will be closer and closer to the actual data. And then and, um, here at step nine, this uh, is the sum of nine trees times 0 0.1, and um, you can see that now we basically have a pretty good approximation of our function here. It's pretty nice and smooth. Questions? Um, it's the weighted. So basically, each time you fit the residual, so here, you fit the residual, say, at the beginning you just fit the target, and then you take um, F1, and you take uh, alpha times F1. So you always multiply it by alpha before you add it to your like solution, basically. It doesn't move down the, the learning rate doesn't move us down the, no, the learning it basically it uh, so if you want to think of this as gradient descent it's gradient descent in the space of all linear combinations of trees which is maybe a little bit hard to think about um, so really you should think about this formula maybe and um, so in the basically each time you fit a tree, subtracting this tree moves you closer to the solution. And so you can see this is the residual, and adding alpha times the tree uh, uh, more and more will give you a better and better solution. The multiplying by alpha just basically means you don't take, you, you don't f fully trust the tree. You don't take the predictions of the tree entirely. You just um, trust each of the tr uh, each tree just a little bit and you move to a little bit in the direction of the prediction of the tree Sorry, so do you use alpha for the, the alpha is a like a hyperparameter that you specify beforehand uh, so you can't use alpha no you don't usually use different alpha you just set it at the beginning In the end, I trust all the trees equally, yes. But then you just said you probably trust some trees more than the other? Did you just say that? No. no, I didn't say that. So there is actually, there's other algorithms, other boosting algorithms. In other boost, I think you have a weighted sum that's like, where it's different trust to different models, but in gradient boosting, it's all the same. Okay. So, Question is, is it advisable to increase alpha? Um, I mean, this is a hyperparameter that you basically need to tune. And there's a strong relation between what you pick as alpha and how many, uh, how many trees you need to get a good approximation. If I make alpha very, very small, I need to add up many, many trees to get a good approximation. If I make alpha uh, very big, I can get a good approximation more quickly but I'm also more likely to overfit the data set more quickly. Um.
So basically, it's alpha is sort of a way to try to avoid overfitting uh, too much. And so here, if um, if I had set alpha much smaller after predict, like if I set it to 0 0.01, that at then at step nine, I would uh, still be much closer to zero, and I would have to add many more trees to actually make a good prediction. All right, so. I tried to visualize the same for, for classification, and I'm doing this in two dimensions now on my favorite half moon data set. Um, so, here, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a slide um, for this, but what you're trying to do is you're using again the uh, log loss as you did, we did in logistic regression. And so, um, yeah, I should have actually had it. So, um, you're, you're trying to regress the probabilities is what you're trying to do. And so you're trying to uh, find a function. Um, so, you actually, so even in the classification case, gradient boosting uh, classifier uses uh, regression trees internally. So gradient boosting never uses trees for classification, it always uses trees for regression. And, uh, but the thing that you're trying to regress is the probabilities using the, main, so the same model that we used in logistic regression. Only now the function is not a linear function, the function is this tree. And so here you can see that, um, okay, I'm not sure how much you can see, but here, so I'm using uh, maximum depth of two, so again, that means I probably have something like four, four leave nodes. So here, after the first split, you can see there's one region up here, one region here, one region here, one region here, and, um, then I add another, but um, yeah. and then I add an, another estimator that has like different regions. And so um, I didn't plot the trees here because it's a little hard to see. But basically, they make probabilistic predictions, and you add them up to get closer and closer to the final model. So this looks a little bit uh, similar to the random forest, only that here, basically, the more models we add, we get progressively closer and closer to the target. So this is actually a big difference to the random forest. In the random forest, adding more trees doesn't make you overfit more. It just reduces the variance. In gradient boosting, because you fit the trees dependent on your previous fit, uh, adding more trees, you can always perfectly fit the data set. You can always perfectly overfit. And yeah, depending on your learning rate, you might need less or more trees. All right, so why, why is gradient boosting great? Um, so this is under advantages, uh, but so in scikit-learn, the current gradient boosting implementation is actually quite a bit slower to train than the random forest because the current gradient boosting implementation is not multi-core. Um, but even the old gradient boosting implementation in scikit-learn is much faster to predict than a random forest. It's much faster to predict and much smaller in memory because uh, the trees are usually very shallow and you need much fewer of them than you would need in a random forest. So random forest usually has very, very deep trees. Gradient boosting has less deep trees. And the trees are also simpler because you're actually conditionally building these trees to perfectly explain your data. There's a, a couple of really high quality implementations for gradient boosting. So the gradient boosting regressor in scikit-learn is uh, good, but not particularly fast. There's other implementation. Uh, the most famous ones is probably XGBoost and LightGBM. They use some additional tricks that I'm going to talk about in, in a little bit. Um, one of my postdocs, uh, Nicola, implemented PyGBM, which is basically a Python port of, of LightGBM. So XGBoost and LightGBM, they have scikit-learn compatible interfaces. You can just uh, install them and use them. Um, there's a new implementation that was going to be merged in scikit-learn soon. That's basically as fast as these, but it's in scikit-learn because why should we be any slower? Um, so if you want, you can, if you're experiment, if you like to experiment, um, get the new scikit-learn implementation from this pull request, and 
break it and so we can improve it. So yeah, so these are these implementations are very fast to train and they're also very fast to predict. And typically they're more accurate than random forests. So uh, gradient boosting models are sometimes a little bit harder to tune, so you need to tune this learning rate, you might need to tune other things. Random forests, basically, if you have enough trees, random forests always work, um, but they, they might not give you like the last percent. Very often, gradient boosting models, if you tune them well, they're able to do a little bit better than random forests. And if model size and model speed are important, gradient boosting models will be much better than random forests. So I think, yeah, on Monday someone asked me, how should we trade off in a random forest um, number of trees and uh, depth of the tree? And I said, use gradient boosting instead, because if you're concerned about uh, uh, memory size, gradient boosting will be much smaller and much faster. So I say typically more accurate, because you, there's, you can't make a statement like, this model is always better than this model. Um, you can always find data sets where this is not true, but basically on average, on data sets people are interested in, people find gradient boosting uh, often outperforms random forests. But it's, usually I, as a baseline, I tend to use random forests because I don't need to tune them, and so, um, so usually my, my approach would be to a new problem, try a linear model, try a random forest, and then if the random forest is not good enough for me, then I spend some time uh, building a gradient boosting model. So, as I said, the main thing is basically picking number of estimators and the learning rate. There are several ways to do this. One way is to uh, just pick the number of estimators depending on how much budget or time you have, and then tune the learning rate. Um, I'll talk about how you can do it the other way around in a little bit. You, you don't want to do a grid search over both number of estimators and the learning rate, because then most of the results will be bad, because they are so highly interdependent. You can tune max features if you want. Um, but it's not as critical. Usually it's more critical to um, prune the trees so you have uh, usually very small max depth. So typically people used to use like a depth of two or three, but now I've seen people with depths like 20. It obviously depends on the data set size, so if you have a bigger data set, you can build deeper trees and not overfit. So this is sort of the somewhat vanilla gradient boosting idea. Um, other questions so far? More like a tree is a general question. I remember the book saying that like tree-based methods sometimes don't work well on really like wide sparse data sets. Is there like a quick answer for why that is? It was more general tree question. The tree question was, um, so I think that, that was my book, right? My book says um, trees might not work so well on very wide sparse data sets. And um, the reason is that usually trees only fit on a single feature, but in a very wide sparse data set, each single feature is not very important. And so you basically need to build very deep trees to capture even simple concepts. Um, and like any split that you pick, this split will be non-informative most of the time because the feature will mostly be zero. So whatever your topmost um, top feature is, basically what your topmost split is, most of the time it will, won't matter. And so you will go always the same path. And um, if you want to learn interactions, you have to learn them multiple times. So if, um, hmm. so okay, if you, want to, if you want to learn an or, let's say you have 10 features that um, if any of them is on, it's class one. 
Um, that's very simple to express in a linear model. If you want to express, express this in um, a tree, you need to have uh, a tree of depth 10. And you, in each part, you need to, and it needs to also be wide, because for to uh, implement an OR, you need to, no, actually for an OR, it's not true. I think for an AND, yes. Okay, I have to think about the exact example, but basically the point is you need to relearn things in multiple parts of the tree. But, and each part of the tree will only be hit very seldomly. That's not to say that it never works. It's definitely worth trying. Um, it's just, it would not be my go-to model. And some of these, uh, I'm not sure, some of these implementations are um, uh, optimized for sparse data and some of them are not. And I don't know off the top of my head which are not. If the, mo if the uh, implementation is not optimized, it will be super slow compared to an optimized implementation. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about like extreme gradient boosting, which is basically the tricks that um, XGBoost added and then later on uh, LightGBM added more tricks on top of that and now they're competing. And there's another thing by Yandex that's called CatBoost that I think I mentioned on Piazza. And uh, everybody's competing on who has the fastest gradient boosting, which is great because it means we get the best gradient boosting algorithms. So one thing that they changed is um, the split criterion in like a somewhat subtle way. Um, so basically they changed w the regression trees. So, for, so this is something they changed for each individual tree, not for, so it's a tr more tree thing than a whole gradient boosting thing. So they uh, optimized the weights in the leaf. So now the leaf is not just um, the mean of the training points in the leaf, but it's like some parameter that you call W and you optimize this. It's gonna be very close to the mean of the training points in the leaf because that's just what the math says it optimizes, but we think of these as parameters now. This means we can now add a regularizer and great, uh, XGBoost adds L1 and L2 regularizers though I think the L2 one is um, more commonly used. So basically, you, you, know, you don't say, okay, we're predicting the mean of these points, but we're predicting uh, something that's close to the mean, but we also L2 regularize it. Then for the split criteria, we don't use our squared loss um, or our log loss. Instead, um, they include the uh, Hessian of the uh, of these parameters as well. So here, and so this, they end up with this splitting criterion. So basically, uh, for a particular split, you want to see how good is the split, and um, so in what we did before in the decision trees, this would be like impurity of the leaf to the left impurity of the leaf to the right, minus impurity of the, uh, the parent. And so here, uh, the i's are the indices of the data points that are in a particular leaf. And um, so, and now the impurity that we have is the, uh, the gradients uh, squared divided by um, the Hessian plus lambda, where lambda is the L2 um, regularizer. And so now what we're fitting is basically in, um, instead of sort of doing um, second, sorry, first order gradients, basically what they're doing is second order gradients. And so they do um, something like uh, Newton's algorithm on um, using the trees. So you can look at the derivative of this but it's quite simple, and they basically just say, oh, um, 
this is the loss we want to optimize. We do um, second order Taylor expansion, and then so now we compute the Hessians also. So this is the first thing they kind of change. Um, thinking of the leaf values as weights, then optimizing them using a second order method and regularizing them. So I guess maybe that's, that's three things they changed. Um, another thing that is, um, yeah? Oh, the gamma is the learning rate, sorry. Yes. Yes, L lambda would be the, wait, lambda here is, oh yeah, it depends on which alpha. Uh, lambda here is like the alpha and rich. Uh, lambda here is alpha and rich. Yes, it's the L2 regularizer. SGD. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Gamma is the alpha in a gradient boosting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so maybe I should make these gammas. It's so, a so, so good point. I'm gonna make these gammas, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or make the alpha and the other one. So, so this gamma is this alpha. Um. Cool. So another change that they did, um, I mean, that was already kind of well known, but uh, that it implemented very well is binning. So here, this is um, an implementation um, for split finding in the tree. And so here, um, basically here you're computing the impurities and you're imputing the gradients and the hessians and so on. Um, but the main thing that's interesting is um, basically you ort, you, uh, whenever you try to find a split, you need to sort the, uh, all the samples in a particular node by a given feature that you want to split on. So this is the finding the threshold. You basically, you need to do a linear scan uh, through all possible thresholds, which means you need to sort uh, the data points. This is n log n, and it's in the innermost loop. So this is actually the most expensive operation in all of this, is every time you want to uh, scan through, um, or every time you want to split a node, you need to sc uh, scan through all the features. Sorry, not, not the scanning, the sorting is the, is the expensive one. And uh, as the name of the slide says, the, the way to accelerate this is binning. So instead of sorting, we, um, we propose percentiles for each feature. And so here, say, it can be done globally or per split. Usually, it's done uh, globally. So you take your feature, and um, you compute the percentiles, and then you bin your data. So this is a pre-processing step where you basically discretize your data. So now it's uh, ordinal. So you can think of this basically, I mean, binning is very similar to sort of hashing. So now I don't, um, if I want to count anything, I don't need, or if I uh, want to try all of the different thresholds, all the possible thresholds are the bin edges. And I can compute the function values given the given threshold in linear time. So the operation went from uh, n log n for sorting to linear scan n. The cost of this is obviously that now um, this evaluation of the splits is not exact anymore. It's approximated because the only thresholds we look at are the thresholds given by uh, the bin edges. But this makes everything much, much, much faster. And um, yeah, so I mean, this is like sort of a, a general like computer science trick to go from n log n to n. Uh, so avoid sorting by doing discretization. So that's kind of obvious in a sense, but also very helpful. Oh, there's a typo in the slide. Um, great. So another thing that they 
uh, found in a paper or found in like their, in their practice during gradient boosting is that aggressive subsampling actually can avoid overfitting. So um, we already said that ensembles might be good if they um, if the models are uncorrelated, and they say this is even true for these gradient boosting models, which are sort of interdependent. And so their paper says, according uh, to user feedback, using column subsampling prevents overfitting even more so than traditional row subsampling. So um, rows are data points, columns are features. So what they're saying is actually we should um, subsample the features for the tree, for a whole tree. Um, so this is related to what's done in random forest. In random forest, we subsample the features in each node. Here, we subsample the features uh, for the whole tree. This, all, this makes the uh, building of the tree also faster, but it also prevents overfitting according to their experiments. And so each of these trees in the gradient boosting step is often built just with a, basically a subset of both the rows and the columns. And yeah, so these are also things you can tune and you can ask, okay, why is this, why do we do it exactly this way here and the slightly different way in a random forest? And uh, there's not really a good answer, and there's probably many ways to uh, make this work. But these are basically, this, this is um, something that people just found out. This works well in practice to make these things um, not overfit so much. So if you want to um, try XGBoost, uh, I recommend you install it with Conda. That's probably the easiest. And then you get the uh, XGB classifier and XGB regressor. They work like scikit-learn models. You can use them uh, with scikit-learn pipelines and uh, anything you want. Uh, they actually they support missing values, and I think they also support categorical variables out of the box, so you wouldn't have to do one-hot encoding for this. And it also supports multi-core uh, fitting. Here's um, a a bad benchmark um, showing time and accuracy of the scikit learn the XG boost one on, I don't even remember which data set this was. I think it was a synthetic data set. And you can see, so here, this is the number of features. And you can see the accuracy is quite similar, though actually um, XG boost is a little bit better. And you can see here for 10, 100, and 1,000 data points, they're, um, sort of similar speed, but once you get to 10,000 data points, XGBoost is uh, way faster. And if you go to even bigger data sets, uh, the current grain boosting classifier and regressor, they may just crash because they take too much memory. And uh, XGBoost and LightGBM are both much faster. Um, yeah, both XGBoost and LightGBM also have GPU support in case you have a very beefy GPU. Um, And yeah, but as I said, we'll get something in Cyclone fast if you want to play around with it. Um, yeah. So, talking a little bit more about how to tune um, sort of the a little bit more advanced models. So, um, as I said, so adding trees can lead to overfitting, but it depends on uh, your learning rate. So one thing you can do is you can do early stopping, um, which you might be familiar with from neural networks. So basically, you, t you keep a validation set, and you keep adding trees until you figure out on your validation set, I start to overfit, and then you stop. So this way, you can basically avoid searching over the number of estimators. You can just try adding more and more and more, and once it goes uh, bad, then you stop. The downside of doing this is that you have to keep a validation set which you can't use for training, so you keep out some data. You can do this uh, with XGBoost and with scikit-learn, and uh, I'm not sure if you can do it with LightGBM, but I'm pretty sure you can. So if you use this, then uh, tuning 
looks more li like this. So, um, I mean, now you can basically pick a learning rate and then do early stopping. Oops. And the learning rate depends a little bit on um, your budget, or you can just sort of uh, grid search the learning rate and still do early stopping. Um, you want to, you can tune max features. You probably want to tune the column and row subsampling. And if you do um, column subsampling, it's not entirely clear if you need max features as well, but you know you can try. And as I said, you typically want strong pruning via max depth. You could also use one of the other methods, like um, max, max leaf nodes. I'm not sure if anyone ever does that. It's sort of traditional to use max depth, but probably other things also work. And you can uh, search the regularization, um, so usually the L2 regularization of the leaf weights. So now you have way more parameters and that you can all tune, and uh, that's what people mostly do during Kaggle competitions is tuning the parameters of XGBoost. So, yeah. And so you'll get to play around with this a little bit in the next homework. So this is, was the last of the tree-based methods that I wanted to talk about. And so just sort of coming back, um, why, we, why we like trees, and to summarize uh, why they're great, they can model uh, nonlinear relationships. They don't care about the scaling of the data because they look at thresholds only. And so they also don't care about the distribution and there's much less need for feature engineering. Or at least there's no need for univariate feature engineering because the tree doesn't care. Um, if you use a single tree, they are very interpretable if they're small. If they're big, they may be not very interpretable. Um, single trees are not that great a predictor, or, though, and they might overfit strongly. But if you want a very simple model that you can show to someone, maybe a small single tree is good. Um, if you want a more robust model, use the random forest. They are really a great benchmark. Um, it's actually quite hard to, like, consistently outperform a random forest. So I, uh, I worked a little bit on automatic machine learning where people try to automatically find the best model. And it's quite hard to beat the strategy that says, just always use a random forest. If you just always use a random forest, you're always gonna be pretty good. Um, and um, if you invest more time, you can uh, usually make gradient boosting perform better if you tune it correctly. So um, yeah, as, as someone mentioned before, maybe I should put this on the slide, also is that um, for very wide data sets and sparse data sets, tree-based models might not be the best and you might want to use a linear model instead. It never hurts to also just try a random forest. And yeah, so in random forest, more trees are always better. In gradient boosting, number of trees that is good depends strongly on the learning rate. Okay, so there's a, a good, somewhat advanced uh, question, which is, can you warm start the models in scikit-learn and or maybe in general? And um, the answer is, depends a little bit on what you mean by warm starting. So you, I showed you last time uh, that you can warm start um, random forest, and you can do the same for gradient boosting, but what it will do is it will add new trees using a new data, it will not change the previous trees. You cannot basically mathematically do iterative learning on, tr on normal decision trees because um, if you get a new data point, the topmost split might not be optimal anymore. And you need to change the topmost split and that means you threw away everything. Um, there is something called uh, Mondrian forests that are, you, that, um, are specifically for um, doing online learning, and basically they split so randomly that it, that it doesn't matter if your data changes. So if you're really interested in this, you can look into Mondrian forests. 
um, it might be good enough just to add more trees using the new data. So if you have a random forest model and you get new data, you can add more trees using the new data. But it will not update the old trees, but maybe it's good enough. Or if you have enough time, just build the model from scratch. Uh, can you repeat this, please? Um, okay, the question is, what are strategies for, for tuning the models? And so, actually, I mean, I didn't, I didn't give you ranges here. This is basically the, the tuning guide. Um, to be honest, I don't really have very good ranges. Um, so as I said, max, max depth, I would start with like one, two, three, but people sometimes uh, go to like 20, but I would start with like smaller ones. Learning rate, usually on an uh, exponential scale, so 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, and then if you have a smaller learning rate, it really increase the number of trees, um, or you just use early stopping. Um, regularization, I haven't actually used that much, but I would also use that, uh, search that on a logarithmic scale. And uh, basically, if you look at all the parameters, you have like a 10 dimensional optimization problem, and um, doing a grid search on all of these will take way too long. So you can basically just manually do it or just tune a couple of the parameters, or you can use a technique that we're going to talk about next week. Okay. The, qu the question is, how do you interpret random forest? And the ga same goes basically for uh, gradient boosting. Both of these are uh, more or less uh, a sum of trees. Like the random forest is an average of trees, and the gradient boosting is a sum of trees. Just how you build them is different. And um, you can do the same feature importances I did for random forest with gradient boosting. So basically, you get the feature importance for uh, each tree, and then you just sum them up or average them. And so the feature importance is the whenever you split on a given node, you count the impurity decrease. This is not the ideal method of doing this, and also next week I'll show you how to do it better. Um, so generally, if you do either random forest or gradient boosting, the model itself will not be really interpretable anymore, uh, or at least not directly. If you have hundreds of trees, they're very big, or if you just have tens of trees, no one's going to look through these models. So you definitely need additional tools to understand what's happening within the model. You can't just print it out. So sort of this interpret trees are interpretable is not that true in practice unless you have a single very small tree. Like you can, you can understand every step, but there are so many steps that it's impossible to understand. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, maybe um, one more comment before I move on is there's like hundreds, maybe thousands different um, machine learning models out there. Uh, but if you look at applications, people use logistic regression and gradient boosting 99% of the time, so th which is why I focus on these. So I think linear models and tree-based models are sort of the most commonly used families. They are the ones that will most likely help you in practice, together with neural networks if you have like enough data. So that's why I really think you should uh, try to understand uh, tree-based ensembles because yeah, they're just tree-based models and linear models are really sort of in the core tool set of doing supervised learning. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is sort of something completely different. Okay, someone just woke up when I said that. Um, so, which is calibration. This ties into model evaluation, which we'll talk uh, about more next week also. There's so much we're gonna talk about next week. It's great. Um, so, very often, you're not only interested in uh, the predicted label by a model, but you're interested in predicted probabilities. So, okay, I have a 
I should have put this in the in the read, but it has a link to a great paper. But um, so, for example, think um, of a model that says you don't have cancer, versus the model says there is a 40% likelihood you have cancer. If you naively threshold the 40%, this is your outcome. I would react very differently to these two statements. And so th there's, and we'll talk much more about these kind of statements next week. But um, if we want to make these kind of statements, one of the things that we have to do is we have to get probabilities that are actually reliable. In scikit-learn, models have this predict proba, but this, just because there, it says it's probabilities doesn't mean these are like good probabilities. As I said, um, if you build a decision tree fully, it will always give you 100% certainty because all the leaves will be pure. And just because it gives you 100% certainty, I mean, th that's, that's clearly not correct, right? It shouldn't be 100% certain, but it is. And so calibration basically means how good are our probability estimates? Um, there's a couple of ways to first um, measure that and then to improve that. And I'm only one, gonna talk through some relatively uh, simple ones. So the first one is um, a calibration curve. And the way calibration curves work um, is, so you have your true label. In reality, very often, you only observe discrete outcomes. So we assume our, let's, I think this whole lecture will mostly be binary now, but let's assume we just observe zeros and ones. You just know this person got sick, this person didn't get sick. You never observe the probability. It's very rare in the real world that you observe a probability. You just observe something happen or not happen. So my, my y true, or my, my true labels are zeros and ones, and I have some probability for being, uh, set, let's say this is p of one. And so, given by my model. Ideally, there's some relationship, and like if this is high, this is one. But I wanna figure out, is this, uh, how well does this relationship work? And I can, uh, measure that even though I only have zeros and ones, no probabilities. And the way I do this is I sort by the estimated probabilities. Then I do some binning, like here, just as a cartoon example, basically, I bin on one third of the data. Um, so I, make, I create three bins. Um, so the bin goes from zero to one third from two, one third to two third and from two third to, th to one. And then I count for each of these bins, um, how often was um, the prediction true? And ideally, in the first bin, the prediction should be true uh, a third of the time. In the second bin, it should be true two thirds of the time Oh, actually, no, sorry, it should be the, the bin centers. So that's not actually true. So in the, in the, in the, in the center one, it should be 0.5% uh, of the time. In the first one, it should be 15% um, uh, uh, of the time. And the last one, it should be like 85% of the time. So if these probabilities were accurate, this is how often I would assume the true target to be one. And so now I can just look at these different bins so in reality, you use, would use more than three. And I can see, um, ideally, I want a straight line uh, which says the, the fraction of ones I observed is what the probabilities told me the fraction of ones is going to be. All right. So how do I do this with scikit-learn? How does that look in reality? So what I'm... Um, Using here's uh, the cover type data set, which is like a traditional machine learning data set that's kind of big, so I have enough points to get nice res resolution. I use logistic regression model here. Um, so this data set I'm using 
52,000 samples with um, 54 features. And it's like somewhat balanced. It's like 20,000 samples in one class and 30,000 in the other class. And so here, I'm using a trick that I didn't really talk about, but basically I make it automatically find a C for me, and the C is two point something. Cool. So that's a logistic regression model. Um, and now what I want to, um, what I'm interested in is, are the probabilities that this logistic regression model gave me, gave me are these any good? Should I trust them? So here. I um, look at the probabilities. These are the probabilities on the test set. These are the true predictions. And so now I want to figure out, do these probabilities actually give me a good, like, uh, a good estimate of how likely is it to be a one? And so now I can put this in the calibration curve. Um, sorry, in the, in the calibration curve uh, function. So here, I want to measure this on a holdout set. So here, I'm using, it, using a test set because I split the training test set. You could use this also on your validation set. So I put it on a training set. I get the probabilities on my test set. Um, so this is the logistic regression probabilities of class one. And then I call calibration curve with the test labels and the probabilities. And um, for the five bins, I get, for the first bin, the true probability of um, there being a 1 was 0.2. The prediction was 0.1, uh, 0.14. For the second one, the true probability would be 0.3. The predicted one was 0.3, and so on. And you can see that, actually, they match up pretty well. Um, here's a, a, a calibration diagram for this. For the lowest bin, it didn't do that well, but for the higher bin, but it's still pretty reasonable. So what this tells me is that these probabilities are quite okay, and if I want to use these probabilities in decision making, um, th that would that would be uh, a reasonable thing to do. Sure. So, I take the predicted probabilities and I sort them. And so now I do like equally spaced binning on uh, the probabilities between zero and one. And now, um, for every, for all the predicted probabilities that go in the first bin. I take their average. This is the predicted probability. For all of them, I also have a zero or one pre uh, prediction. It's a true prediction. So I count the frequency of ones. This is the true probability of ones in this bin. Okay. So the y in that bin is the true label. Yes. Like the label. This y is the true label. Okay. And yes. The y is your probability yes. Y being one. Just one? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, so yes, the, the, it's monotonous in the predicted probability. Always, yes. But it doesn't, but. Uh, so then why do we want to store it as that separate bit? Why, do we, why don't we just randomly put it into the prediction? Like, I mean, like, you sort it and then, cut, like, then they cut it in discrete parts, right? The first bit will always have the highest probability, and then we'll start with the highest probability. Yes. I mean, the first bin will have the highest break probabilities, but you don't know what is the highest um, true probability, right? Yeah. So here, this this synthetic example, the highest true probability was not was not uh, was not very low. So basically, you can see if the if the if the line is not diagonal, that means the probabilities that are predicted are not really um, indicative of the real probabilities. I don't know how else to do it. Well, you can just run, run it with points in the bins, right? Because you already have the x, y, and then x, y, and then it doesn't really matter. You just put some, some points in one bin, and then count the average of the x, y, and the bins. Why do you want to store them? Um, oh, I mean, 
you don't you, you can just bin them yes i mean you don't uh you can also i mean that makes it easier to visualize what's happening i mean it's the same operation so um yeah you can just bin them and then sort them for plotting but sort of you you um i guess So, technically, you don't need to sort them. It was more sort of trying to visualize what's happening. Um, just, but the bins are going to be so sorted, right? I mean, you want the bins to be sorted. Yeah. I think it would be very unlikely that if you um, just bin them without sorting them, um, that you would get the full spectrum of probabilities that you're interested in, right? Um, Mm. The bins are usually fixed, so they're not dependent on the data. So you know what the bins are in advance? Yes, I know. Okay, um. okay I'm not sure. I don't think there's like an important point here, so I'm, I'm just going to keep moving on. Um, the point is bin the data. And um, you have fixed bins, and so it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, what, what matters is the number of bins. So if you have less bins, obviously, you get a coarser, coarser measurement. If you have more bins, you might sort of get um, a very noisy measurement. And you can use a binning algorithm to figure out how um, what's a good number of bins, or you could just eyeball it. So here, on the same data set, um, Oh yeah, and obviously, if you have a bigger data set, you can have more bins because you, have, you can get uh, more out of your data set. So here, um, this is using a couple more bins uh, on three different classifiers. And um, you can see that the logistic regression actually does like pretty reasonably. Your decision tree classifier, as I uh, mentioned, only has basically two modes. So you can see all the, here at the bottom, this is sort of, these are the number of points in the bins. And there, there's only points, sorry, the number of points in class one in the bins, I guess. No, so this is the number of points in the bin overall. And so all points are either at zero or at one. And you can see that um, the, the line is pretty, is sort of skewed because uh, it's not a perfect classifier. And basically, it has no real, real sense of uncertainty. A thing that's very common with the random forest classifier is that you get kind of a sigmoid shape. So it's, uh, wait, I was. Let me not say it the wrong way around. Yeah, it's too uncertain. OK, yes. So the predict probability is 0.1 when the, or like, yeah, it's about 0.1 when the fraction of positives is actually 0. So it, is, it doesn't trust itself as much as it should, um, which is maybe not, not that bad, but it basically means that your probabilities are not what you expect them to be. Um, there are several ways to like get to a number from this diagram. Um, one is basically measuring the distance from the diagonal here using binning. Um, one thing that has um, been found quite helpful is the uh, uh, Breer score, or Breyer. I think it's Breyer score, actually. The Breyer score. Um, and what that does is basically the mean squared error of probability estimates. So you take the probability of one minus the outcome zero or one, and then sum this up. And uh, so this actually doesn't exactly measure the calibration, but it measures a combination of the calibration and uh, the accuracy. You can measure the accuracy and the calibration like separately. This basically um, measures both of them at once. And you can see the numbers here. Um, 
and yeah low is good and actually so this is the best but mostly because most of the data is in the very far bins and so there it's doing pretty well also the model is pretty accurate overall all right so but let's say we know this now we know our model gives us slightly weird probabilities and we want good probabilities and um, the way you do this is calibrating what calibration is is basically build another model uh, build a regression model it's a 1d model going from the old probabilities to better probabilities so it's a univariate model um, so you got out a score some models like support vector machines don't even have a probability they just give you a score and now let's say we want to take the score or the random forest or a decision tree they gave you something that's kind of bad um, and we want to find the true probabilities um, so there's like two two models uh, of there's fcalib two kind of families of models that are usually used um, that I want to talk about next. One is a sigmoid or plaque scaling. The other one is um, isotonic regression. The interesting thing here again is that you don't need to have ground truth probabilities to make this happen. You can use similar tricks and with the diagram to um, get good probability estimates even though you don't have ground truth probabilities, which is kind of neat. So um, I think I called plot scaling uh, is basically a 1D logistic regression, and it just looks like this. Um, actually, there's also there's an offset which I didn't put in here, and this works well for SVMs. Basically, you have um, a single parameter W and an offset, and you learn a um, sigmoid function with a given like uh, W. Um, the other thing is um, that you can use is isotonic regression. Isotonic regression is a non-parametric estimate. So here, you, in plus scaling, you basically have two parameters, W and B. And I didn't put the B on the slide. Um, and isotonic regression is a non-parametric estimate, so that's um, very flexible. But you're in 1D, so it's kind of restricted also. and um, what isotonic regression does it is it learns the best possible mono, uh, monotonic monotonic where's the emphasis in this word doesn't matter uh, the best possible uh, monotone function um, in on this 1D problem and so this is uh, it learns a step function as you can see here so kind of the way you can think about it is that groups they tend to constant parts and there's steps in between them and so this is actually if you want to optimize MSE it finds uh, via some uh, dynamic programming trickery uh, the optimum function to optimize the MSE between uh, among all monotonous functions so here this example is kind of to illustrate what uh, what isotonic regression does um, as I showed you in like two slides, in um, the calibration case, the target is always either zero or one because we don't have probabilities in general. We only have zero or one probabilities, but we still want to use these regression models. Um, one other note is uh, how do you build this model? So using the training data set is bad because um, the model was built in a training data set, so it will be way too good on a training data set. Um, it will be way too optimistic. And so you can either use a holdout set to train this uh, calibration model, or you can use cross validation. So fitting this as a tonal regression or fitting this um, the sigmoid, um, you can use using holdout or cross validation. One simple way is, yeah, you can use, if you want to use cross-validation, you basically um, get an unbiased uh, probability estimate on the holdout set. So every time you split, let's say you have 
uh, you five-fold cross-validation, you have uh, four uh, folds in a training set, one in a test set, you train on the four, you make the probability predictions for the first one. This gives you some probabilities and you'll repeat this. In the end, you'll have probabilities for each point in the training set, but they won't be too optimistic because there will be held out probabilities. And then we can use this as a, tra as a training set for, my, for the calibration model. So the data set that comes to the calibration model looks something like this. Um, so the true validation label um, is either zero or one, and the predicted probabilities are whatever the model gave. And so now I want to fit a sigmoid or isotonic regression to this. And so the outcome of this will look something like this. So, it's like, it's a little bit weird because uh, the target is always zero or one, but the regression function gives you things in between. Um, but it turns out that if you use this, actually, uh, you get good probabilities out. Because it's sort of, it's very unlikely that this 1D function will overfit, because it's just 1D. And so the probabilities that you get out of this will actually be uh, quite good. So the, w the way to do this with scikit-learn is using calibrated classifier CV. Um, this does the um, calibration for you internally. So here I do a random forest uh, without this, uh, plot the calibration curve. Again, it's too uncertain as we saw before. Now we can try to calibrate this. Um, here I'm uh, said there's, um, you can either use a validation set or cross-validation. Here I'm using a validation set. So I gave it the already fitted model. For CV I say pre-fit, meaning I already fit this model. Don't worry about doing cross-validation. I use the sigmoid method and then I fit it on the validation set. So I have a training set in which I fit the random force, and then I'm using a validation set in which I fit the uh, calibration. And then I want to know, well, did I do a good job with this calibration? And I look at the probabilities on the test set that I visualize then. And I do the same thing for the isotonic regression. And so now this is all on the test set. I could look at how calibrated is this model. Um, on the test set, before calibration and after calibration with sigmoid or isotonic regression. And you can see that the, uh, so here I'm showing the Breyer score. The Breyer score is uh, somewhat lower. But in particular, you can see that the um, calibration curve looks much better. Both of them look pretty decent. And so now, you know, for this model, I can trust the probabilities. I can do the same thing with um, yeah, calibrated classifier CV. So here, I'd, um, I don't need to give it a model that I fitted already. So here, our F is just a model, and it will do cross-validation to get out the probabilities and then fit on the data set. So here, um, I don't need to hold out the validation set because calibrated classifier CV will do this automatically. This is kind of nicer, but takes longer because I have to do cross-validation. And so here I just give it the training set. It will create probabilities on the training set doing cross-validation, then fit the calibration model on the held out parts and so on, as I described. And then I can uh, look at the probabilities on the test set. And it looks similarly uh, well. We can also do the same for multi-class. Um, on multi-class multi is a little bit more complicated though because um, um, because now you're basically learning a function on a simplex. So um, the space of all probabilities is the simplex. It's the point of all, uh, it's the space of all points of a given length that's summed to one. Right, so if I have three classes, I have this simplex here. Um, I have 
uh, which is basically, it lives in three dimensions, uh, but it's two dimensional. And um, so now I have a function on the plane. If I have uh, four classes, I have a function on a volume. And so these functions would be much more complex to learn. So you can't do something like isotonic regression there. You can st still do sigmoid calibration, which basically now means I'm using, uh, I'm learning multinomial logistic regression on the output scores. And everything else stays the same, only I'm doing multinomial logistic regression. It's much harder to visualize this, though, and it's um, much harder to interpret, I find. But you can do it, and uh, you can also see, measure then that the ca calibration gets better if you do this. So here, um, this is the this is um, the change of probabilities, uh, or sorry, this is the function that was learned on this plane using a sigmoid calibrator, um, shown as a vector field, and so I find these are much harder to read than than this. Um, so yeah. All right. Any more questions? <laughs>